mentioned just now, um, uh, not only because it's recent, but also because I think it's sort of focused on many of the issues that are in people's minds. Um, and then to talk about a few other areas of work that we have been doing or are doing um, uh, that I think are particularly important. Uh, and then I think some of the more general questions about what to do uh, are, are worth uh, a discussion. So tried to leave enough time for. for um, so uh, this is the work of quite a lot of colleagues, um, mainly those who are highlighted, also a number of others. Uh, sounds like someone is not on mute. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, in our center, uh, and uh, I'll talk about some of this. Um, so the first topic I want to just briefly mention, uh, because it sets the stage for some of the other key points, is the background in Wuhan. Um, and this reflects uh, a piece of work that's still uh, finishing up peer review, I hope, um, led by Roran Lee, um, where we just did a very simple thing, which was to uh, extract from Wuhan CDC online database uh, the number of individuals in critical care, uh, sorry, the number of individuals critically ill um, over on, uh, prevalent on each day uh, in Wuhan and, um, and compare that on a per capita basis to, for example, the U.S. Uh, intensive care uh, empty beds um, and the U.S. intensive care uh, total beds. Um, and this, in my mind, this single figure is kind of the motivation for what we're all trying to do with social distancing, which is to keep the, the hospital system and particularly the intensive care system um, from being overwhelmed uh, because you see that uh, the peak demand for critical care in Wuhan would have uh, filled every, essentially every bed in the United States uh, per capita. And, um, but the other, uh, so that I think is fairly well appreciated by everyone. What I think is maybe less widely understood is the lag times involved in the system. So the, the lockdown of Wuhan was on January 23rd. Um, we'll come back in a few minutes to the controversy about, uh, about whether that was fully effective in, in turning the curve over or not. Uh, that's the last thing I want to talk about in this talk. But um, but the the next round of interventions was on February 2nd. And what's clear here is that there's a really long lag in the system um, due to the fact that people stay in intensive care for a while, but especially the fact that they, uh, that they um, take some time to get sick enough for intensive care. So that the control measure implemented here takes something like four weeks to uh, manifest as a peak in um, in intensive care demand. So the, those who think about control theory understand that dealing with these really long lags uh, is a challenge, especially if we are having a hard time monitoring mild cases, uh, as is the case in many places. But we do need to, and this motivates the need for testing surveillance, uh, testing for surveillance, uh, as opposed to just testing for medical care purposes in order to have a sense of the mild cases and even the asymptomatic cases and what direction they're trending because uh, we can't wait until we see the problem at the at the intensive care setting. So the with that as background, uh, we embarked almost immediately after this became obvious as a problem on trying to understand what we could learn from other seasonal, um, other coronaviruses. Uh, there are four seasonal coronaviruses that circulate every year in temperate climates um, and peak in the winter, two alpha coronaviruses and two betas. Uh, betas are the group that includes SARS-CoV-2 as well as SARS and MERS viruses. So these were the ones on which we focused. Um, uh, and just to try to understand what's the seasonal pattern of change. Um, so. One challenge of that is that you need to have some kind of a proxy for incidence, which is the thing you would like to to model, namely the number of new cases per population per per week or per day. 
And there is no perfect proxy for incidents uh, because nobody is systematically measuring the same people uh, over and over, uh, or even a known uh, sample from the same people over and over. Um, but, but nonetheless, there are are better and worse proxies, and and some of them are shown here, and you can see that they kind of qualitatively at least look the same, although although quantitatively. Uh, some are, are a little bit different. And using standard methods developed by Wallinga and Tunis in, in the Netherlands um, during the SARS pandemic, we uh, estimate a daily reproductive number. Uh, that is the number of secondary cases generated by each case, assuming that this is a linear proxy for, for incidence. And <clears throat> And assuming certain things about the the serial interval, the time between infections, because that's also not known for these coronaviruses, but rather fairly robustly to various assumptions, and you can see these in the in the different um, uh, the different lines here of the same color, which are varying assumptions. What you find is that there is a peak of infectiousness or of transmissibility um, in the uh, in the uh, late is this I think the scale is a little funny um i'm not sure what exactly where the that's not the beginning of 20 yes it is sorry yeah so there's a peak in the late fall uh in transmissibility and because that is essentially the derivative of the case curve uh the case curve peaks in the uh in the winter around january um and uh, and declines, and you can see suggestion of competition between these uh, two coronaviruses in the sense that they uh, that they tend to be one or the other in any given year, uh, with this exception. Well, they often tend to be one or the other, um, uh, and uh, dominated in in um, in a season. Um, what we can then do is try to decompose that seasonal fluctuation in the reproduction number into a seasonal component, uh, which is assumed to be the same every year uh, by month or by, by week, and that's this yellow spline. Um, and the other factor that contributes to the decline of, uh, of cases uh, as the winter progresses, which is that susceptible hosts are depleted. Um, and so the, those are the, the blue curve uh, showing the depletion by HKU1 and the red curve showing the depletion by um, by OC43, the other coronavirus. And you can see that there's some evidence of cross immunity. For example, here, uh, the, the um, reduction in the OC43 transmission by both incidents of, of OC43 and of HKU1. Um, so these are two different coronaviruses that seem to provide cross immunity to each other, although less than the immunity they provide each provides to itself. Um, so it's sort of consistent with what you uh, what you would expect. Uh, this is the regression framework in which we did it, also developed by Yako Wallinga and his colleagues. Um, um, and and the take home message is that indeed seasonality is, as for flu, a combination of seasonal favorability for transmission, which is highest uh, uh, in the late fall, early winter, and um, and depletion of susceptibles that then, as the winter wears on, makes it even less favorable uh, than the seasonal conditions would allow. Um, and we can then um, simplify that in, simplify that in the uh, seasonal driving sense uh, into a transmission model where we look at uh, cross uh, at the two strains and cross immunity between them, um, with a seasonal amplitude that's uh, uh, that the best fit. That's not exactly the fit that's shown here, but the best fit in uh, in our final model was uh, an amplitude of about 21% uh, reduction from peak to trough, so about about 10% uh, up and down from the mean transmission in a cosine function. Um, and this transmission model looks like some kind of uh, 
Eastern mystic mystical thing or something, but it's just showing the progression of people from susceptible to exposed to one virus strain to exposed to the other virus strain and, and infectious with the other. So it's an SIR, SEIR type model uh, for two strains. <coughs> um, and when you fit that model uh, to the data from from the U.S., uh, you get reasonable fits from uh, the simulated in dots and the and the data in in solid lines um, that shows the alternating pattern um, by season for or um, especially the seasons that are dominated by OC43, um, and you get a a fairly good fit, especially during the times when there's a lot of data, which is the, the darker colored dots here, um, you get a fairly good fit to the uh, sort of raw raw estimates that we had before from just this sort of sine wave of transmissibility uh, overlaid with the decline in susceptible hosts. So it seems like these two factors reasonably capture the, um, the, the seasonality um, of the viruses. Um, and then allow us to ask the question, is, you know, is that amount of seasonal forcing a lot or a little? And uh, as you have probably heard, the estimates for the reproduction number of CoV-2 are around two to three, some, some higher, but, but maybe around two to three is the close to consensus estimates. So a 21, and those were measured mostly in the winter. So a 21% decline from two to three, from two or three, is not enough to, by itself, um, reduce transmission of COVID-2 uh, below the critical threshold of one in the summer. Although it may provide some help. So that's some um, some data analysis. Uh, I can take questions on that now, or or move on and continue. Sort of the setup to the next set. Well, um, one question on this, Mark, is um, it seems that the uh, outbreak of these previous viruses was somewhat earlier in the season, sort of in the fall. Um, I guess as much as we have information, I mean, that may have been the, the case again in China, but not in other countries this time around. Does that matter or how we should apply these results to the uh, new virus? Um, you mean that <clears throat> you mean that this peaks in um, January, which is sort of the close to the beginning of the of the COVID two emergence? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it, I think it, as a general point, the the uh, dynamics of seasonal viruses, flu or coronaviruses, we now see. Having analyzed it, nobody had ever looked really before. But the the dynamics are really driven by two different things. One is this seasonal variability in suscept in in transmission, which may be heat or maybe humidity or it may be schools, um, possibly a common, most likely a combination of those and maybe other factors. For flu, it's clearly schools plus plus humidity uh, that drives it, and. And then, on the other hand, the depletion of susceptibles. So, um, so seasonal viruses are seasonal not only because of of the environment, but because they're only just building up enough susceptibles to have an epidemic. As the environment becomes more favorable, they use that small pool up, and then they're done. Um, and so, seasonal viruses are seasonal the way they are importantly because of lack of susceptibles. But when you start with a new virus where susceptible hosts are very plentiful, it breaks all the rules. And we see that in pandemic flu that it, it can be almost any time of year. Um, so there's no reason why this virus needed to uh, wait for a, a favorable time. Um, having said that, uh, if you take literally the timing of the, of the peak transmissibility here, um, for these other viruses, uh, you're certainly right that subtracting 20% might be too generous. It might be really that you should subtract 10% or something from, you know, maybe maybe by the time we were into the uh, into the 
real transmission of coronavirus, it, of, of SARS-CoV-2, it was already kind of in the winter rather than the fall level of transmissibility. But I wouldn't, as you can see from these confidence bounds, I wouldn't put tremendous faith in the exact timing or, or magnitudes. Um, but, uh, but I think it, it is probably a good guess that, that transmissibility was not at its very peak when uh, in December and January, it was probably a little bit off its peak. Okay, uh, so I'll continue. Um, the next part of this uh, work, and this, all of these figures that I'm showing for this first part of the talk are in the paper that was in Science yesterday. Um, so the next part of this is to then think about what happens with and without an intervention. Um, so to that, to that um, transmission model, we added a third strain, which is SARS-CoV-2. And we made varying assumptions about the duration of immunity and the extent of cross immunity to the seasonal coronas. Um, <clears throat> to try to, <coughs> try to see what could happen. And of course, we really have no idea uh, other than by assuming it's the same as things we do know about because there's no data yet on, on immunity or cross immunity. Um, but so among the scenarios that can happen, if you have an introduction here uh, in early 2020, as, as in uh, places outside of China in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you have, a, if, if unmitigated, a big out, outbreak followed by uh, continued annual outbreaks, assuming that the duration of immunity is short, around 40 weeks. And that's in the same range that we assume immunity to be from, uh, from uh, the seasonal viruses. It could be considerably longer um, from a more severe infection like this one. Um, so in that category, in that case, uh, you, you have a longer period of, in which the population is not receptive to further viral spread, um, and then uh, outbreaks sporadically, maybe on a longer time scale thereafter. And this is classic what's known as post-honeymoon dynamics for a, for a, or it's almost the same thing as post-honeymoon dynamics for an infectious disease where a very large outbreak overshoots the number of susceptibles a lot uh, and so keeps things under control for a while. And then as births or waning immunity replenish the susceptible pool, you get a, uh, a rebound. Can people see my, my, cur my cursor? I'm gesturing at things, but I don't know whether I need to use some other button or something. No, we, we can follow the, you, you the, cursor. the cursor. Okay, great. Um, if we assume greater degree of seasonality, then the outbreaks become more punctuated because, uh, again, they, they very much deplete the susceptible pool and then, uh, and, and then uh, need to wait for a, a um, long enough to, to get um, immunity down in the population. And if immunity is permanent, then, and there's some cross immunity, then we could in fact see uh, elimination. Uh, and then in the most perverse scenario, uh, if there is enough cross immunity from these other coronaviruses to SARS-CoV-2, then you might have a situation where SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, disappears effectively for several years and then resurges uh, afterwards um, because the immunity from the direct immunity that's the strongest has been slowly waning but but being propped up by the cross immunity from the seasonal viruses. So there's really quite a range of scenarios and I think it really suggests that we need to understand immunity and cross immunity better, a theme to which I will return uh, at the end. So then we began to consider what happens with interventions, and uh, and we did that now for now since we're thinking in a more short-term fashion. Um, now disregarding the seasonal coronaviruses, which means either that they, well, which is essentially assuming that they do not provide any cross immunity to SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter if if SARS-CoV-2 causes immunity to them as long as they don't affect SARS-CoV-2 strongly. 
and we created then a very, very simple uh, SEIR type model um, in which uh, individuals are sort of fated at the time they get infected either to have a mild illness or a um, uh, hospitalized illness or critical illness. And these assumptions are, are quite important to the quantitative outcomes. Um, and these were, in fact, taken directly from the Imperial College report uh, because they had uh, reviewed the literature more carefully than we had time to, so we just took their numbers. Um, and we'll come back to that also as, a, as a, an issue because um, those numbers may be revised as, as better data come in from different places. But, um, but the assumption is that uh, the large majority are, are mild and, um, and then 3% require hospitalization and only in another percent and a half almost require ICU. <clears throat> These durations of stay are also important. I don't know if I put a slide in this, but uh, a clever reviewer pointed out that the distribution of the time that you uh, stay in ICU is really important if it's if it's exponential as we sometimes as we usually model it. Uh, there's less congestion in the ICUs, but if it's a more peaked um, uh, normal type distribution, uh, then the ICUs stay fuller for longer with the same inputs. Um, and so that's a sensitivity analysis we explore uh, in the paper, but I won't talk about in detail. So that's another, another data need is actually to understand the distribution of stays in ICU in order to do capacity planning. So then we modeled uh, the effects of one-time social distancing. And here we took a little bit different approach from what some other groups have done. It's our view, or at least my view, that, um, that we don't really know what the impact of school closures or social gatherings or any of these other individual interventions are uh, on transmission of a virus when people are behaving in a way they've never behaved uh, in modern history and when um, when it's a virus we don't really understand yet. So rather than trying to model individual interventions, we simply made the strong simplifying assumption um, that, uh, that the interventions collectively made some reduction in the reproduction number, the total, the, the transmissibility of the virus. Um, and we modeled the, you know, the proposal that seemed to be coming uh, from our White House uh, at the time of one-time social distancing for a period of time and, um, and looked at what that would mean with varying levels of reduction in the reproduction number, with the green being the largest reproduction reduction of 60%. Uh, blue being 40% and red being 20% compared to black with no intervention. And the, sh the, the curves show the, um, the uh, case numbers on the left axis and the critical cases on the right axis lagged by, uh, by the delay in requiring critical care of several weeks. And what you see is that uh, compared to no uh, no intervention, one-time social distancing can make a difference, um, and actually in some cases can make a fairly large difference, but is, is not a way of just getting a single peak. Uh, it always leads to, well, it's not a way of getting a single peak during the distancing. It either pushes it off into the future if it's short um, and, and or relatively ineffectual, uh, uh, or or you get a single peak, uh, and then um, uh, that that is, well, yeah, it pushes it into the future. Sorry, I'm uh, having a hard time reading my own figures. Um, and then in in the longest period we considered here, you can get uh, a second peak later on um, after the social distancing has ended. You drive the cases way way down, and then uh, and then. Uh, get a second peak after the distancing has ended. So that led us to consider the possibility of intermittent social distancing. Um, and there we wanted to look at the impact of seasonality on, on, uh, on our results. And I'm just trying to see, sorry, on my 
previous slide, um, we were assuming uh, that there was seasonality. Um, <clears throat> and sorry, that was one, one thing I meant to emphasize and just missed. Um, so with seasonality, the timing of a peak matters. And so if you have seasonality of the magnitude we estimated for the other coronaviruses, there are situations in which especially very effective uh, social distancing at the beginning can push the peak off into a time that is actually more favorable for transmission and thereby increase the total area under the curve as well as the height of the peak. So if you believe that seasonality uh, affects this virus, then one-time social distancing uh, is a potentially um, worse than nothing intervention, um, especially if it's very effective. If it's moderately effective, then you sort of split the, the uh, transmission into two curves and it can actually, you can get lucky with this, with this red curve. But if it's very effective and you squash it down uh, and just then to stop, then you get a bigger peak in the, in the next uh, cold time, the next winter and fall. And of course, uh, I don't have to tell economists that bad in the future is better than bad now, um, but, but it's actually worse in the future under the seasonality scenario. In the, in the um, uh, non-seasonal scenario, you can't do any harm. You can only do good uh, with social distancing. So then we asked the question, if we're going to think about social distancing not as a one-time thing, but as a multiple thing, multiple round thing, uh, how would that look? Um, and so we considered a scenario in which the goal of the social distancing is to protect critical care capacity. And so we set some threshold at which you would uh, turn on social distancing when critical when when cases not critical cases but when cases pass some threshold um, and a, another threshold at which you would turn it off uh, when they get below uh, a certain number and those are the those are the um, uh, dashed lines in this figure and so what we find is that we have a period uh, and and you set those thresholds uh, in order to uh, sort of you, you work backwards from what do we need to, the thresholds to be so that we don't exceed the critical care capacity uh, knowing that there's going to be this lag. So you, you have a period of on social distancing, a period of uh, until uh, cases uh, get below this threshold, and then you turn off social distancing. They rapidly increase. Uh, you turn on social distancing again. Uh, and so forth, and you can see just a little bit that the that the on periods get shorter and the off periods get longer, and that's because the reproduction number is declining slowly due to the buildup of herd immunity. So even without seasonality, uh, if 20% of the population is immune, that means that the reproduction number is down 20% um, from its baseline, and so uh, transmission is... Uh, slower in the off periods and, uh, and the reduction in cases is faster in the on periods. So you begin to build up momentum, but it's a uh, fairly long and painful process uh, over several years. If there's seasonality, we saw in, in the one-time situation that seasonality could make things worse. Um, in, the, in the repeated situation, seasonality actually makes things better because you have these periods of respite that create, uh, that allow you to stay open longer in the summer um, while, um, while not building up cases as fast, and that allows you to then um, uh, gain some herd immunity, but uh, while staying open for a longer period uh, before you have to uh, close again. Um, and then, Mark, um, yeah. there's, there's a question from one of yeah. the colleagues. Uh, this is Philip Hartman. Question um, on the previous slide. What, what what's the intuition for the necessity of the second green peak for highest reduction of R zero? This one. Yes. Sort of the the intuition here. Why is it? Um. um 
So the intuition behind all of this is that what regulates transmission is interventions plus numbers of proportion of susceptible hosts. So the interventions slow transmission, but they also slow the acquisition of immunity and the, the decline of susceptibility in the population. So just as, I mean, and this is sort of the 1918 flu lesson as well, if you put off transmission, uh, putting aside seasonality, you've done good in two ways. This was sort of the, the flatten the curve idea that was circulating in uh, in February and, and March of this year. You've, you've done good in two ways. You've delayed the bad, bad thing from happening, and you've also um, reduced the area under the curve. The, but you don't, but, but once you let up on social distancing or whatever the control interventions are, the virus is still there and the people are still susceptible. So you're back where you were at the beginning. And then if there's seasonality, you're in a potentially worse position. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so that is really the premise of all of this, is that uh, that when effective reproduction number, the average number of cases caused by one case, exceeds one, um, you will have increasing cases. That's how the models all work. And when it's less than one, you'll have decreasing cases. The way to get it below one is either to intervene to, to reduce contacts, or to um, have more immunity in the population so that each contact is less likely to cause a transmission because uh, it's within an, uh, an immune person, um, or to have seasonal conditions just reduce the, the efficiency of transmission. Those are the three influences that we consider. Um, so it's it, the, the whole concept is premised on the idea that if we don't have immunity, then there is no long-term um, if we don't have herd immunity in the population, there is no long-term uh, solution to continued spread because summer doesn't last forever and, uh, and the interventions aren't in place. Um, so that underlies all of this. Uh, one part we found interesting and slightly unanticipated, especially in advance, uh, uh, about this model is that if you increase ICU capacity, of course that's good for the, the people uh, and for the healthcare system, but it also means that this regime, if you, if you have to follow it, is, um, is more off time and uh, fewer cycles because essentially you are now staying below a higher threshold and so you can afford to let more cases build up and so the acquisition of herd immunity here on the right uh, up to the, the point where it would by itself stop transmission occurs more quickly um, and uh, and if you overlay that with seasonality that's even more pronounced because uh, you get all these cases below threshold uh, in the summer um, uh, and so so having greater ICU capacity is beneficial not only for the system but also for the for the progress of this kind of approach to social distancing. <coughs> um, and importantly, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, if you could have a treatment that that cut demand in half for the intensive care unit, so a treatment for mild cases that that um, reduce their chances of progressing to critical, that would have, as you might imagine, almost the same effect of, of um, protecting, uh, almost the same effect overall. So, um, and of course would be much better because the goal, if, if you have to do this kind of project, the goal is to build up as many immune people in the population with as few uh, serious illnesses and deaths as possible, and the, um, the drug treatment would do that, the, the ICU capacity increase would be a less uh, effective way to do that. Um, so the conclusion... Mark, yeah. yeah, Mark, so before you conclude on this, 
a um, few questions. Um, so one is, in everything you're showing us, you are, of course, assuming that there is no vaccine available in the meantime. So it's all about building up um, herd immunity. So um, uh, just asking you whether that's correct and B, whether it, you also sort of ruled it out that before the next season, that's the next winter, when, when you get your second peaks in the simulations, there will be a vaccine. That's one question. Okay. Yeah. Um, the assumption is there's no vaccine. Um, I think the numbers people are giving for when there might be a vaccine are all over the place, um, but with a seeming trend downward, um, for which I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, the latest thing that was said by a scientist at our National Institutes of Health is that healthcare workers might have emergency use in the fall. That strikes me as uh, not impossible, but extremely unlikely. Um, well, very unlikely, let's say. Um, uh, and she said um, possibly general use in the spring. I think that's conceivable um, if everything goes right and there is a good vaccine um, and, and a lot of sort of international agreements come together to make it possible. So I think it's, that's the, that would be unprecedentedly fast for an unusually, for a, a not easy vaccine to make, uh, to make a good one of at least. Um, but uh, I think widespread availability of a vaccine, um, sort of even for um, a billion people say, uh, by the fall, by is uh, sorry by the by a year from now is uh, is going to be a challenge. Um, but yes, that that is the assumption, and uh, I, I can take other questions. I, I I don't have a slide, although I should have. I was just uh, have been rushed in putting the talk together, but. Um, but I do want to actually talk about sort of putting this more in, in context of outside the model. What's the what's the reality, and what might what might make the model wrong? Because I would like it to be wrong for obvious reasons. So there are a few more questions coming in. Um, so one is uh, indeed outside of your model. Um, so this is from the Diana Garcia Lopez. She's asking: um, In your model, you assume a large, fully mixed population. Uh, to what extent does the population structure matter? Um, are you or other research groups considering running individual-based simulations, maybe with explicit uh, population structures considered? I'm also thinking here that, uh, I mean, a lot of discussions as to, especially among economists, of how to get uh, the labor force uh, mobilized again. Um, so if we were to sort of move away from lockdown to having the uh, some of the social distancing measures still in place for the inactive population, but maybe relax for the active population, would that work? And how uh, have you thought about that or others working on this? What would it mean for these simulations? Yeah. Um, so yes, the assumption is of a well-mixed single population, that makes things uh, worse in general. Um, and if you include either structure or heterogeneity and risk or both, it tends to reduce the total attack rates. Um, and people are doing that. Uh, the imperial model, which, which has results similar to these, um, for the overlapping cases, they don't consider seasonality, to my knowledge, but they consider um, a lot more details about the population structure. Um, <coughs> does get qualitative, <coughs> qualitatively similar results, um, uh, and others are also using more complex models, um, which I think will get qualitatively similar results. But if there is uh, significant heterogeneity of various sorts 
uh, such that some people just are very hard to infect, then that would be all for the good um, compared to the scenarios that we're considering. Um, on the other hand, if there's a lot of, if there are pockets of people who remain uninfected by chance and then uh, and then get infected, that could sort of prolong the the period um, when there's significant infection. So it's mostly uh, it's mostly the answer could only get happier uh, as you incorporate more structure. Um, Um, and, then uh, and then in terms of, right, in terms of sort of uh, alternative approaches to getting out of this, mm -hmm. um, I think that is obviously the question of the moment. I don't have anything model-based or, or very intelligent to say about that right now, um, uh, except that I think there has been a strong feeling in the modeling community that the, the problem with the, you know, lock away the everybody over 60 and, and just restart the economy with everyone else approach is that, first of all, although cases, although severity is lower in, in the young and healthy, it's not zero and it's not even close to zero. So that would be a potentially quite, um, there would still be a lot of morbidity and mortality from that, um, although obviously less and with the benefit that we would have more economic activity. <clears throat> and then the, the second problem, just about the practicalities of how well you can insulate the, if you're allowing widespread contagion in the, in the uh, under whatever, under 60 population, um, those people do have to have some contact with the at-risk people just to get them food and, and care and medicine and all the things they need. Um, and so sort of letting contagion go uh, while protecting the most vulnerable seems like a challenge. Uh, but putting making that a harder number, I think, is going to be difficult. And more likely, we'll have somebody will try to do it, and then we'll find out how well it works. Um, thanks, Mark. Then there is a question from Gerhard Rinsler. Um, this question is whether uh, you and other researchers will be able to produce reliable estimates of the seasonality of the new virus within the next months, ideally before the winter season. Mm. I mean, what kind of data needs do you have for that? Uh, at what point in time do you think this is realistic? That's a good question. Excuse me for eating. I just haven't had time to do so. Um, uh, it's going to be really hard because we're not in a normal year. Um, and we don't, I mean, in contrast to the um, seasonal coronaviruses, we don't even have a decent proxy for cumulative incidents, although we may begin to have serologic surveys that would help us to nail down that piece of the of the change but but assuming that there's ongoing control measures in place i think it's going to be really hard to say much about the seasonality especially if it's in this sort of 20 percent range i mean if it was 80 percent it would probably be quite obvious somewhere but but 20 percent is consistent i think with uh with the fact that it's spread you know that it has been spreading everywhere in the world where it's been introduced to a first approximation, um, and maybe a little faster some places and slower other places, I think I think it's seasonality when you have everybody susceptible and weird behavioral patterns. I think it's going to be really hard to tease apart. It's a good question. I haven't thought hadn't thought about actually trying to do that <laughs> uh, because it's. It's uh, it seems too hard, but it's probably worth trying to figure out if it's possible. Yeah, it's a question from one of our researchers thinking about future research. So um, then there's um, also a question still on your modeling approach. Um, just to make sure we understand, uh, is this more more or less a closed model whereby you assume that these viruses 
uh, will survive. So there are these cycles, but viruses don't disappear entirely. And if so, is this also what we should expect for this new virus? So the, it's, it's basically, I mean, is the conclusion here that we should count on there will be uh, another peak? It's just a matter of how big and when. So one-time distancing is not enough, but also we should count on this virus to be around for a while. Yeah, I think, so as a mathematical question, the model is ordinary differential equations, so it never goes to zero. Yes. And so in that sense, uh, it can always come back in the model, but that's a statement about the model. Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, whether it comes back um, in real life, um, you know, we have two hemispheres, so it's always it's always reasonably favorable for transmission somewhere. Um, uh, and so I think uh, the scenario that we model with permanent immunity to this, um, if that were so, I think we might, in fact, have elimination at least for long enough so that we would not be worrying about racing to get a vaccine. We could just get the vaccine. Well, we'd probably be racing because we wouldn't know, but but we might uh, we might have real elimination. But I think permanent immunity to coronaviruses doesn't seem to be uh, the rule. Even even SARS and MERS coronaviruses, the limited data that exist, uh, and I wrote about this in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, um, with citations, that's the new thing. As you put citations in op-ed pieces, it's weird, but but true. Um, uh, the, the MERS and SARS, it seems that immunity begins to diminish in in two or three years, at least the neutralizing ability of the sera from from infected people. So it's not um, it's not. Uh, reasonable to, I mean, it's reasonable to hope, but it's not reasonable to expect that immunity would be permanent to this coronavirus. But, you know, nobody nobody cared about coronaviruses until SARS, uh, and then they started to care and then got distracted, and then MERS, uh, and people cared again and got distracted. So I think, you know, the field of coronavirus immunology is probably 100 papers or something. Uh, it's not it's not a well understood thing. Um, and there is another question from Diana, uh, just a clarifying question um, as to whether the viruses that you have considered in your analysis, uh, whether they also all have been uh, present in Europe. Yeah. Um, uh, I believe that all of these four coronaviruses are present in essentially everywhere. HKU1 stands for Hong Kong University 1. Yeah. Uh, and one of the other ones, one of the alphas, is called NL63, which I assume stands for Netherlands 63. I'm not sure. Um, uh, so I think uh, that all of these are, and, and actually most of the research on the immunology of, this, of those viruses um, was conducted in the UK. So I think I'm 95% sure that all four viruses are essentially everywhere. More seasonal in the north and south and less in the tropics. Okay. Um, so you are on your concluding slide, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I have uh, I have some other things to talk about, but... Yeah, please. Uh, maybe I'll... So the conclusions you've now seen, uh, uh, and I've already said, I think it is worth just sort of saying... Um, some of the things that were in the discussion of this paper that I should have put on a slide but just didn't get to. Um, the first is that uh, we wanted to be clear that we're not saying that this multiple rounds of social distancing is a recommendation or a or a um, good idea or or in any way desirable, uh, except in the way that it seems to be one tool to keep the um, healthcare system uh, intact while not uh, while not being closed all the time. 
Um, but we recognize that it's both probably practically challenging and uh, a lot of time on social distancing. So this is a sort of epidemiologic analysis in the absence, obviously, of considering the other impacts uh, and therefore can't be an all things considered recommendation, but rather uh, a recommendation that one time social distancing doesn't accomplish the stated goal and that multiple rounds would. Uh, but but as we say in the paper, we're really trying to stimulate both efforts to bring the problem to an end through faster vaccines and also uh, creative solutions to other types of uh, ways to reopen, um, such as the ones that have been uh, talked about briefly here, or uh, perhaps uh, serologic passports as one option or, or other things. Um, oh, and then, uh, and then I promised at the beginning to say, say something about other ways the model could be wrong. So I think uh, these, these numbers uh, about the relative proportion of severe and mild illness um, look like it's already very heavily weighted towards mild, but, but I think it's worth mentioning that um, until we have serology, there is still the former pos formal possibility that uh, there's a lot more infection and that this is actually a larger fraction even than, than we assume. Um, uh, I don't think that that's the case. That's why we assume these numbers. But but the way I hope that we're, one way I hope we're uh, wrong is that um, is that there are in fact a lot more immune people in the population than we think um, because they've just slipped through the this whole cascade without ever being detected. Um, I just saw on Twitter this morning uh, a report from the Netherlands of some some new serology, which I assume is probably being done uh, by by Erasmus, which is a very careful lab, and so I tend to believe it. Um, uh, that suggests that we haven't been totally far off in our estimates, um, but but. Uh, I think that is an open question still until we have more more good data um, and uh, I very much hope that it's that there are more cases out there that we don't know about um, I think yeah, that's the most sensitive piece of the assumptions, although there are obviously many others yeah, there was some uh, uh, piece put up by the Netherlands um, but I had a um, on the blood bank uh, donors where they had also tested whether there were any uh, positive antibodies and apparently yeah. three percent of the population showed that uh, and so those numbers are indeed quite high um there is one more question from yeah. uh Lev Radnowski. um this is more of an economist question um should we think of COVID 19 based on your experience as a one in a 100 years catastrophic event. The reason he's asking this is um, this would inform us of how much we should invest in future preparedness. Um, uh, I don't know how to answer that in the sense that if you take the last event that was similar to this uh, mm -hmm. magnitude, I think it is the 1918. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what it was like to be around in 1957. I don't think it was it was quite on this scale. Um, but the question is whether that hazard is constant over time uh, or whether it's accelerating. Um, certainly, people in my field spend a lot of uh, spend a lot of time. Uh, um, talking about reasons why the trend might be for this kind of thing to happen more with global travel and with um, with destruction of habitats that lead to zoonotic uh, emergences of uh, emergences of zoonotic disease um, uh, and increasing drug resistance and also I think I mean I've been thinking about this, 1918 maybe was a worse virus than this one, uh, all else equal. But my sense is that we didn't have an intensive care 
we didn't have intensive care to protect, and so we didn't, there wasn't this, you know, this is a sort of hard thing to think about. Maybe economists are better at it. There was no, there was no sense of overwhelming the healthcare system because there wasn't that much of a healthcare system, at least that was effective. Um, and so now we invest in protecting something that we didn't have in those days. So I, I don't know how to think about sort of as you build up capital <laughs> that you want to protect, whether that changes your investments. Um, so I think I would sort of probably go with my professional orientation and say some of the causes of this are accelerating and most of the causes, uh, I can't think of any causes of it that are slowing down or that are reducing the hazard every year. So I would think that, you know, if this interval was 100 years, um, given the number of near misses with SARS and MERS, uh, it's reasonable to expect that it's accelerating rather than uh, one in 100 years. But, but I think, you know, we're getting soft here. <laughs> um, so we're coming to the end of uh, your talk. Um, okay. um, so I just wanted to ask one last question. Uh, what, what's your professional advice to the economist community, to economic policy makers? Sort of your one one line, one your one liner. Oh. Gosh. Uh, um, I think you've left me so speechless. I I don't know what to say. I think I think uh, we need solutions. Uh, please please do listen to your public health colleagues uh, when they say something's impossible and push back on them, push back on us, uh, but but also listen. <laughs> so my interactions with economists have uh, been some very positive and uh, some very extremely positive uh, and really trying to be constructive in finding solutions that are both possible and ambitious. Uh, and, and then with some others, uh, um, they have been more like uh, sort of uh, dismissive in the sense of um, public health people just think small and don't realize that with enough money you can do anything. Uh, and I think that's sometimes true and sometimes not, but uh, but we should have a discussion about it rather than assumptions. Uh, but that that's uh, a little bit based on some individual interactions. Uh, but we're going to need your help uh, desperately because obviously everything we recommend has huge economic consequences, uh, and, and we got to work together. Thank you, Mark. Uh, a previous speaker earlier this week in the series said that, at least for the time being, we, we play second fiddle to you and your colleagues as economists, and uh, we are learning a lot. But it would, of course, be much better if we can work together, especially when we get to the recovery phase. So. Yeah. I want to thank you very much on behalf of all the colleagues at the ECB. And um, you. Um, this is, of course, a reality and a rather gloomy outlook for us, but uh, that's what it is. Um, so um, we will circulate also um, your article together with your presentation. And uh, thank you very much for doing this. Stay healthy. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you, you all of you as well. And I'll share the slope. Uh, it was a very rich discussion, but I think there are a few other pieces that may be interesting and and point have references that people can can look up if they're interested. We will look at that. Thank you very much.